Welcome to lecture eight of ECE 5312, um, Modern Digital Communications. So today, we're going to look at two more uh, sort of generalized modulation schemes that uh, encode binary information in variations in the amplitude and phase of an analog uh, waveform like a sine and a cosine. So the first we're going First one we're going to look at is MRE QAM or MRE quadrature amplitude modulation. And then following that, uh, we're going to look at MRE phase shift keying or MPSK. Okay. We're not going to complete the MPSK analysis in this lecture. That will be concluded in the next lecture. In the, um, um, what we're going to do is at least we're going to get it. So in the last lecture, uh, we saw. Um, a, a, a 16 QAM, and it looks nice, right? It's a, a nice orderly pattern of signal constellation points in the real imaginary plane. Uh, we can space them out, in this case uniformly, uh, in both the X and the Y axes by 2A separations between each signal constellation point. Um, suppose we now look at something like 64 QAM, where that means we have um, 64 signal constellation points instead of 16 constellation points, we can have the same sort of um, sort of pattern that we have in the 16 QAM, but many more signal constellation points, right? And as opposed to four bits per symbol, we can represent six bits per symbol in this signal constellation waveform. So you notice that the pattern of a QAM uh, mod, uh, 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 signal essentially um, if we lay it out in terms of this rectangular pattern, it's very nice. It's elegant because you have evenly d dots that are evenly spaced across the real and imaginary axis. And this is powerful stuff because this actually will lend itself to a very nice receiver structure. Let let me actually um, let me actually show show you what I mean because. This is actually quite a critical punchline. So suppose we have how in the x direction, each one of these guys looks like a pulse amplitude modulation. And how in the y axis, they also look like pulse amplitude modulation. In fact, so here's the punchline. MRE QAM is equal to square root of M PAM by square root of M, sorry, should erase that. Pam, where that is in a real. And that is in imaginary. So this is beautiful because what happens is, remember before, like, so what's a really easy receiver structure? Especially if you don't have amplitude distortion in the channel. And that is essentially, you receive a signal and it's at this amplitude. And the next signal is at this amplitude. And the next signal is at this amplitude. So just based on the amplitude per symbol period, you can say what pattern of bits has been transmitted, right? So all you need is a quantizer at the 
And then the index of that quantizer says, ah, this symbol, this pattern of bits was transmitted. Now this pattern, and now this pattern, now this pattern. Now, with quadrature amplitude modulation, where the points are laid out in this grid-like pattern, now all you need to do is, okay, I have in the uh, real axis, I, uh, which amplitude do I have? And in the imaginary axis, which amplitude I have? And you can figure out exactly what binary pattern has been transmitted using two quantizers, one on I and one on Q. And that's what we see on the lecture slide here. What we've got, essentially, is here comes our signal, intercepted signal, that's a MRE QAM signal, and the first thing we do is we multiply it with cosine omega CT in one branch and sine omega CT in another branch. You might say, okay, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? And here's the reason why. Because what you do, so take that signal that I wrote before, SIJ of T is equal to AI cos omega CT BJ sine omega ct. Beautiful, right? And now what happens is, suppose I take si of t and multiply it by cosine omega ct. What happens is, if you multiply this, I have a cos times a cos and a cos times a sine. have cos times a sine and then oh but then if we then it, what what identity it's a frequency term right and what's a cos times a cos we have a dc term plus a, a double frequency term and then a sine times a sine we have a dc term minus a double frequency term but it doesn't matter because if we look at the next step after we multiply by cosine and a sine omega ct, we low pass filter. We basically extract, we pull out, we remove the double frequency terms. There's only a dc term left. And that is going to correspond to either ai or bj. So in the upper branch, what we're going to have, we do sij of t multiplied by cosine omega ct across a symbol period t and then low pass filter get away the, get rid of the, uh, the um, double frequency terms and we sample at every t seconds we get every ai boom 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 and each ai is going to be a different amplitude level and that square root pam the square root m pam detector that guy is a quantizer that quantizes the AI values. Likewise, in the lower branch, same thing. SI, J of T, multiply by sine omega CT. We, and then take the low-pass filter. We get rid of the double frequency terms. All we're left with are the BJs, sampled every T seconds. Do, 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 do. And then we a quantizer, a square root M, PAM, detector, that quantizes all the BJ values and again gives us what are binary values. Boom, 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 boom. Perfect. That's why rectangular or square MREQ signals are wonderful to implement in a receiver because the decoding is so simple. You just need two quantizers, one acting on the real and one acting on the imaginary portion of your data. It's fantastic. And just in case you don't remember what a square root m ham looks like, essentially looks like this guy here. So that looks like some sort of quantization level, right? So what happens is you get some sort of amplitude value. It might be corrupted in noise in either the real or imaginary axes. It does not matter. What the quantizer will do is it will round to the nearest uh, known level. And then that level has an index. And that index corresponds to a pattern of bits. It turns out 
that each amplitude level is represented. This, uh, so if you have square root m, right? Each one is represented by half the total number of bits that's represented by the mqam symbol waveform, right? So if you have, let's say, six bits that represent 64 qam, so 64 qam, you need two 8 pam detectors, one in the real and one in the imaginary axes. Per symbol waveform in real and imaginary domains. So when you apply it, like drawn over here, what you got is you're essentially doing some sort of two dimensional quantization along the real and imaginary axes. All right? And this is wonderful. And this is a linear modulation, it's nothing fancy. So that's why this is such a wonderful result. And it's actually used, if anybody uses them anymore, in telephone line modems. Ha <laughs> ha! Fantastic! So there is a caveat. As despite how wonderful QAM is, there are some limitations for rectangular and square QAM. It's not so good when you have oddball values for M m is equal to 32, or m is equal to 8. Um, or, uh, in these cases, when you have um, the number, uh, when, when you have these, um, like, let's say, in this case, 5 bits per symbol, how do you represent something that, a square signal constellation, when you, d you can't really make a square out of it? Like, so here's an example of m equals 32. Is, is that QAM? Well, yeah. But is it rectangular or square? Uh, no, not, not really. It doesn't look quite like it. So there are some oddball scenarios where you, can't, you cannot form rectangular or square QAM for any number of bits. Uh, it's actually constrained to, to, to only a select uh, set of categories, right? Now, given all this way of representing information in your real and imaginary axes such that all you need at the receiver are just two quantizers acting on the in-phase and quadrature component of your signal. Let's find out what the power efficiency is. And just before, so I'm going to hammer this in to everyone again, just as before. What are, what's the expression for the power efficiency? So power efficiency. It's d min squared over the average energy per bit. And d min squared is equal to the integral from 0 to t, the period of the symbol, delta ft. So the difference between the two closest in terms of, like, you know, how similar they are, the two closest signal waveforms that represent two possible binary patterns, squared dt, right? And E F B is equal to, sorry, um, E B bar is equal to E F bar divided by log 2 of M, which is equal to B. And uh, that is going to be equal to, sorry, ah, I'm making a mistake. And that's going to be equal to um, the average across all possible signals, right? And so what's ESI? And ESI is equal to the integral from 0 to t of SI squared of t dt. So using these same expressions, now what we're going to do is calculate what is the power efficiency of an MRA QAM signal.
So just as before, the first step, d min squared is. So let's, again, without loss in generality, let's just take the two, like there's a loss symmetry, but let's say we take S1 and S2, which are adjacent points, like over here. Um, and they are separated by 2a. So given that, let's say that d min squared is equal to uh, the integral from 0 to t, the delta s t squared dt. <coughs> and if you do the math, and, um, and those cosines and sines disappear because a lot of them become double frequency terms. So those integrate out. What you're left with is 2a squared of t. If you find the average symbol energy, which gives you the average bit energy, um, again, what you'll see is that there is an awful lot of symmetry in MRE QAM when it's laid out in a rectangular or square fashion. So all you really need to do is calculate the average energy in a quadrant, not across all points. So imagine they have signal constellations like 256 QAM. It would be insane if you calculated all 256 signal constellation points. Of course, calculating one-fourth of that, which is 64, is also kind of insane. You get, you get my point. Um, if you can exploit symmetry in these signal constellation diagrams in order to uh, extract what the uh, in order to extract what the average symbol energy is, you're already ahead of the game. It'll save time. So what happens is the energy of symbol uh, S i j is going to be equal to the integral from zero to t of symbol S i j of t squared. You this kind of cool outcome, which is it's going to be equal to a i squared of uh, times t divided by 2 plus bj squared t divided by 2. What it turns out is that the energy is actually somewhat related. This, this um, energy is equal to the square of the amplitudes times the period t divided by 2 in each one of them. And it, this is after working it out. So you have that a i cosine omega ct plus bj sine omega ct. If you do the math and calculate this, you get this kind of nice, elegant result, right? It turns out that if you want to find out what the average symbol energy is, you actually just need to find out what the average is across those ai squareds and bj squareds. And those uh, angled brackets on either side denote an average across all possible values for, uh, for all i and all j. here. So essentially in this scenario it is essentially two square root m pans. So we plug that back into these averages and what we get at the end of the day is this average symbol energy is equal to m squared minus 1 divided by 3 a squared t. And so if we now replace m with square root of m, right, because that's square root m pan, right, what we get instead of m squared is we just get m. And so for m qualm, um, uh, if we find out what the average bit energy is, again, we, we, we divide it by a number of bits. And, and if, let's say, those number of bits is equal to k, we actually get this beautiful outcome at the end, which is 3 factorial k divided by 2 to the k minus 1. And then if you do the sanity check, this actually works out just fine. So um, what we just saw here is sort of like sort of a quick overview of how to calculate the power efficiency of MRE QAM modulation when it's laid out in a rectangular or in a square pattern. And it turns out that if you leverage the ever so beautiful um, pulse amplitude modulation uh, signal constellation the, uh, and, and power efficiency values and, and, and re receiver structures, you, will gr you, you basically get uh, what looks like a really overwhelming and complex looking signal constellation, this two-dimensional QAM signal constellation. It breaks down elegantly into two orthogonal square root M, PAM modulations that are working in concert with each other. And that makes the math and the operation of decoding these symbols all the more easier. Okay. 
So we're going to quickly get started these MRE modulation schemes. In this case, it's MRE phase shift keying. And this is a tricky modulation scheme to deal with because um, you saw what happens when we have M is equal to 64 or M is equal to 256. We have points all over the place. And QAM, In uh, MRE PSK, all the points are constrained. Splitting hairs in terms of choosing different phases for each one of those signal constellation points. And so that's what we have over here, the signal constellation representations. We take two pi radians, which is all around, all, uh, around the circle. M, so larger the M, the smaller the sliver of the phase that we're using to represent every binary pattern using each one of those PSK waveforms, and then I is the index. So what ends up happening is the smaller the sliver, and if there's any imperfections or your phase discriminator at your receiver is not so good, you're going to have a lot of errors. Okay? So this, this is a big problem if your M is too large. Sometimes it's worth using, let's say, for m is equal to 16 or 32 or whatever, like, you know, a reasonable size number. Um, in case, let's say, your channel that you're using, the, that you're transmitting across, like your transmitter is sending information across a channel to a receiver and it suffers from amplitude distortion, but it doesn't suffer from phase distortion, this might be a way of mitigating it. So it's really, it, the, this type of modulation scheme is robust to amplitude distortion. It's also great when you have nonlinear power amplifiers, which also causes amplitude distortion. So there are trade-offs. As engineers, we need to weigh these trade-offs when designing these systems for a specific application. We got to what type of channel do we? Relation scheme to use. Do we care about power efficiency? Like how? Like how much can we, uh, how, how much of an issue is power efficiency? Or um, can we get a better power amplifier? Or is this all we can do in, in, in the nonlinear region? In which case, we might be forced to use a PSK modulation. So the, again, like what we'll see in the next lecture is more of the mathematical analysis of um, the MPSK, which we didn't talk about too much in this lecture. But just keep in mind that there are a lot of these choices, and as engineers, we use these mathematical tools that we're driving now, as well as later on when we do the error performance analysis of these different modulation schemes, in order to figure out what is the best techniques, or technique, if there's only one, uh, that should be used for a specific application, specific hardware, um, for specific data rates. So with that, um, that conclu concludes uh, lecture eight of ECE uh, 4305. Uh, of 5312, sorry.